I go down to the Senate floor to t talk about this in the wake of these shootings because I just really worry that there is something rotting in the American core that is making us numb to this slaughter. I, I think we are on the verge of just thinking that this is normal and losing our sense of outrage. Something rotting in the American core. A huge part of the problem comes from the polarization we see in our country today. And it's not just gun safety. Americans are divided on abortion, education, masks, vaccines, everything associated with the pandemic. As Time magazine once put it, our nation is still divided along the battle lines of the Civil War. So how do we fix it? Let's welcome presidential historian Douglas Brinkley. He's also a history professor at Rice University and MSNBC political analyst Brittany Packnett Cunningham. She was a member of President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force. Doug, it is tough to hear a U.S. senator talk about the rotting core in America. How sick and divided are we as a country when you look historically speaking? Uh, we're extremely sick and divided. It's not a civil war situation. We were divided in the 1960s and late 70s. Uh, we pulled back together a little bit to the point that after Newtown uh, massacre in December of 2012, there was some hope after Sandy Hook Elementary School that there might be some gun legislation. Some Republicans were in the mix. It almost got done, but but not quite. But we, as, we, as you know, uh, it, it's deeply divided now. We can't seem to heal. The hope of, is somebody like Senator Chris um, Murphy, who this week has been very articulate about uh, gun control and, and getting rid of assault weapons or, or of one kind or another. He's been staying on the case for a decade. The hope is that Newtown and Uvalde are like bookends, 10 years of all these mass killings, and that this will be a moment we'll do something. But alas, as you point out, Stephanie, so many other, um, you know, uh, d divisive uh, trigger points in American um, political and social life that uh, one is worried that this isn't going to be game changing enough. We've got to get 73 percent of the American public demanding after Uvalde that um, we do something with um, getting rid of assault weapons that carry large magazines and having better school security and putting more um, money into mental illness. But alas, uh, in, a, in a midterm election year like this, it doesn't seem likely. Brittany, that's one of the questions people are asking. How do you get Americans fired up enough to care more? I was talking about this earlier this week with Jay Johnson and Eric Holder, and I was very surprised. They both said that America needs what they called an Emmett Till moment. Americans should actually see the horrific images from these shootings. What do you think of that? You know, when I was in college, I actually did my senior thesis on the historical significance and the cultural impact of Emmett Till. Uh, and most certainly, I could not anticipate how relevant that work and that study would be to the rest of my life and my work. But I named that paper so the world would see what they'd done to my boy, which is what the indomitable Mamie Till, of course, said about her decision to have that open casket moment, um, to allow the world to see Emmett Till's bloodied, bruised, broken, maimed body, to have Gordon Parks take that photograph that went across the entire world. And clearly, she made a decision that was deeply self-sacrificial to try and stoke the flames, thankfully, of a simmering civil rights movement that, would it, were it not for that, I certainly wouldn't be sitting here talking to you. But we also need to reckon with the fact that even with that picture going a version of viral in the 1950s that it did, that the men who murdered Emmett Till were still acquitted. Carolyn Bryant, the woman who told the lie that Emmett Till whistled at her that cost Emmett his life, she has since come and said that that was a lie and she's been able to deal without any repercussions. The Emmett Till Memorial is still defaced multiple times a year to this day. And it wasn't until the year of our Lord, 2022, when Congress passed and the president signed the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act into existence. And at most, that is a symbolic piece of paper. 
color. So for all of that sacrifice, we certainly saw movement come uh, from people who were already oppressed in this country. But we didn't necessarily see the kind of impact on people who should have been shamed into further action. And I think that we have to be very careful what we are asking parents to do who have to excavate their deepest grief to show these pictures to the world. Of course, they are open to, to make whatever choice that they want. But in this moment of horrifying grief for each of them, we should be very, very careful about what we're asking them to do. And we shouldn't be asking them to do more than the politicians who went on vacation this week. Nicole, you know I've got to ask you. I, I, I mean, people in your position who've lost their children, our government failed them. Our country failed them. Not them, you. So when you hear people talking, saying, let's see those images, what do you think of that? Uh, I think, you know, Stephanie, I'm not personally a fan of, of that. I couldn't do that. I'm not brave enough. I'm not as brave as Emmett Till's mother was. I also have significant concerns, not only about, you know, Emmett Till died uh, over, you know, in 1955 and the quality of movies and culture. People, I don't even think, would be as shocked to see uh, a pile of dead children. Uh, you know, I've had to deal with conspiracy theorists, hoaxers for the last 10 years who've said, show us the pictures. And even if you did, I don't think they would still believe it. I think we're too immune to that sort of violence because we're too used to it anyway. But also, there's just no way. I want people to remember my son for what he was when he was alive. I don't want my surviving son, my mother, Dylan's grandmother, only faced forever on the on the internet with the image of his um, of his body shot. You know, he was shot five times, four times in the torso, one in the back of the head. No one needs to see that. I don't want to see that, and that's not how I want my son remembered. So that's why I work to protect his photos. Well, I will say, Nicole, you are plenty brave, Matthew. Do you think the country is becoming numb and callous, or is it we've just given up on our lawmakers doing anything? Well, I, I'd like to speak to the idea of division in the country. It, the country, actually, the voters are not divided. The voters are not divided. What's divided in the country is a two, a, a two parties, one party who wants nothing to do with solving the problems, the Republican Party, and wants nothing to do with coming to a compromise on all these fundamental issues. If you look at all of the data, 80 percent of the country wants gun reform. 70% of the country was fine about uh, COVID protocols and getting vaccinated. All, and all the, it's a 75% of the country wants to keep Roe versus way as is. So it's not like the country is fundamentally divided. The country is pretty decided on these fundamental issues. So what's the problem? The problem is the political system as it exists today doesn't allow right now, and this is why I'm very concerned about our democracy, the political system does not allow for majority rule. So what we have today is a tyranny of the minority, and that's a fundamental break, a fundamental break in our system where we have the vast public who's pretty united on this. And obviously you have 25 or 30 percent of the people that are off on some crazy island, but you have the vast majority of the country aligned on this. And the, so the problem isn't division within the country. The problem is, is what's happening at a leadership level where a Republican Party refuses, refuses to come to the table and do what the majority wants.